Hey! Hey! So mainly there's a few weird guys like me that like sheep with big horns. <laughs> oh, oh, look at that. <laughs> Right, welcome back. Today we are going hunting for some very unusual sheep. They're actually a little drive away. More on them and more on that in a second. New Zealand is a world leader in grazing livestock systems, beef, dairy, sheep and deer, and they operate those systems at scale, keeping close tabs on the breeding and the feeding of livestock in particular. We've seen that throughout several of the vlogs that we've done this year over in New Zealand. But if you thought that all that time spent at the cutting edge would mean there isn't any capacity for something a bit different and a bit fun, you'd be mistaken. I'm heading down the road to Dunedin on the southeast coast of the South Island to check out some quirky little sheep I bet you have never heard of before. Hey Jin. We're here with Cameron Leslie, who, uh, if you remember when I, just before I came from New Zealand, I put out that video letting you guys know I was coming. And Cameron, very kindly, you, you saw that and you reached out. And, a, you've got some unusual sheep. Yes. And, and also you do some interesting work. And we'll talk a bit about that maybe, even if we don't end up going there. Yep. First of all, Cameron, who are these guys? Uh, these, mostly, there are two sheep in there that um, you'll, you'll, you'll pick them out. <laughs> yeah. big fat weather in there and uh, the ewe at the back, she's half Charolais. Um, but the rest of them, mace, mostly, are Herbert sheep from... Uh, so Herbert sheep are a feral breed from North Otago. Okay. New Zealand has about, I think there's 10 or 12 feral species of sheep. A lot of them come off islands. It's, it's mainly believed that most, especially the island, island based feral sheep were uh, whalers. Okay. To drop off animals so they could come back and eat them when they were. I see like a little cache. Yep. Ah. I think I think that's where most of New Zealand's mammals come from. Yeah. Like, like goats, the whole lot. We're going to have a look at them, eh? To me, the closest thing again I could approximate them to, from what I know, is like so, like a Hebridean or like a, a Shetland sheep, maybe. Yep. Yeah, so be, so you uh, wouldn't expect them to to scan no. particularly high because they're, they're a they are a, um, a yeah primitive, that's unimproved sheep. Yep, the the ewes sort of average about forty kilos. You'll see the ram in there. Massive horns on the left there. Oh yes, I see um, it. That's big horn. Um, in the wild, it's very rare to see one with twins. Yes. I've seen them, but very occasionally. Most of them all have one, and the ewes that you see with twins, they're pretty scraggly looking lambs. They, I mean, in the wild, they don't have the best of feed, to be honest. They're on some pretty hard hill country, yeah. rocky, scrubby terrain. So what would you expect to scan at? Will be a normal scan for you. Uh, they seem to be sitting here. I can get them sitting sort of between 135 and 150. Which is actually it's not like. Yeah, I'm pretty it's, happy with it. It's pretty well. comparable. You know, you have. Is, if you've been to the UK, Cameron, there's quite a lot of common grazing. Yeah. Um, yeah, similar. It's like unimproved, yep. you know, heather and they can sort of lick a bit yep, the, the odd rock occasionally. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And, and like some guys are aiming for 120, you know, yeah. and those are not as sort of if you like primitive sheep as these. What I find interesting about these girls is that the way they look, they do look quite primitive and yet they would have been introduced as presumably something more akin to what we'd know as sheep, right? Because they yeah, wouldn't have been yeah. that recent, like they would have been presumably more uh, white woolly. Yeah, no, it's, it's interesting. I know the Pitt Island sheep, uh, well, I think it's the Pitt Island sheep. They reckon they were white to start with and uh, yeah. basically turned colourful. So it should, I don't know, it suggests that like when you release these sheep out into more wild conditions that they revert. There mm. must be some sort of little toolbox they have genetically. Yeah, it seems to be a bit that way because because if you look at Pitt Island and uh, Chatham Island which mm. are right next to each other, the Chatham Island sheep are all white. Is that right? Yeah. But who they, knows uh, what's going on there? Yeah, yeah I don't, you'd have to assume they were the same sheep when they yeah. release them. Like, it's a hop skip and a jump across the across to the other island. Yeah, exactly. And this is only a few year, hundred years ago, not Presumably not, yeah. not thousands and thousands no, of no. years. As you can imagine, this is hardly the sort of flock to support a salary. So Cameron works full time at a research organization well known in New Zealand called Ag Research. From a distance, they seem to be involved in lots of different projects at the forefront of livestock farming. Although there is one project I'd like to ask Cameron about. And of course, 
how does he marry working at the cutting edge of livestock research with his interest in these little primitive sheep? Hey, let, let's rewind then. What's your day job, Cameron? Uh, I work as a farm senior at AgriSearch in the May. Um, a lot of the stuff we're doing now, we do a lot of methane measurements. And that's that's quite topical because I think there is one of your machines over in the UK at the moment. I'll, I'll try, I saw it on Twitter. Yeah. There might even be two. I think SAC has at least one. So when you say a methane chamber, what, what what's going on there? Uh, so they have these, they're portable now. Um, it's on a big trailer. Yeah. Um, and be, I think there's 12 or 10, 10 or 12 chambers in it. And you, so you put the put the sheep in the chamber, you wand it when it goes in to get its ear tag. Yeah. And then it's in there for 50 minutes, I think they do it now. And they'll take two or three methane measurements, like from the start to the finish. Yes. And so they can tell you that sheep's methane emissions. And then I guess they're breed, aiming to select for lower methane. methane. Yep. Then you, you, you've got this cool ag research, quite sort of, dare I say, high-end level stuff you're, 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 you're contributing to. Yep. How did you end up with these? Uh, the, the sheep perhaps, are, I, I might unfairly say, like at the under, other end of the spectrum, <laughs> yeah, right? Yeah. Basically, I'm a keen hunter as well. Uh -huh. And I was actually hunting these sheep and I was quite impressed by them, um, just their hardiness in general. It's actually hard to compare them because they come here and as you can see from the ground in this paddock, how wet it is. Yeah. Like they've only just come in here this morning. <laughs> they've been in here for about an hour. <laughs> um, so where they come from, it's all hard and rocky and their feet are amazing. Every animal I've ever shot has like perfectly groomed feet. Yes. I've never seen one limping. Um, but then you bring them here and they start getting sculled and... It's like Merinos, oh, isn't yeah. it? Yeah. It's very Merino-like. Um, overgrown feet. Skull's the main one, and uh, Shelly Hoof as well is quite bad with them. Like I said, I've shot probably a hundred wild ones, and I've never seen it once. <laughs> They're all perfect, but as soon as you put them in a wet environment, changes things. I mean, I mean they're pretty good today. Happy. No, you tidied away the lame ones. Yep, I put them in down the bag. <laughs> <laughs> oh, cool. Um, no, that's that's really interesting. So, yeah, I'm actually breeding for horns. Essentially, that's my number one. Well, yeah, it's just like Scottish blackface breeders, but we'll not, yeah, we'll not, yeah. we'll not open that can of worms. <laughs> <laughs> so, and, and they are pretty impressive. Well, they're very impressive. We'll, yeah, we'll get a good look is, at. Uh, he's, he's pretty. Like I said, has he got a name? Uh, that's Big Horn. <laughs> yeah, I actually. Uh, I like it. <laughs> he was he was he was captured, and there's another ewe in here that was actually captured in the same flock, and another guy got him. Um, Tony up in Christchurch and he had him for probably four or five years actually and then he sold him to me. He's, we think he's, I think he's seven or eight years old. Okay. Did my best to get him and now I'm breeding the best rams I can really. If you're breeding rams, is it just for yourself or is it other, are people after them for, for uh, some sort yeah, of commercial so, or, or, or hobby market for them? So mainly there's a few weird guys like me that like sheep with big horns. <laughs> um, but other than that, we breed them for the trophy market. It's actually amazing, really, because there's not many animals. Like, if you had bought a stud ram from someone, and then once he's seven years old, you could then sell him to someone else for yeah. quite a large, more than you paid for him, most likely, and he's got more value at that end. Like, with a ram, most of the time, once you finish with him, he's dog tucker. If you get an animal and he gets to that age, and then he's actually worth more than what you paid for him, and he's been producing velvet. Absolutely, you know? and he gets to live out his last days yeah. out on the hill, and he has one, one bad three. second. Boom. And <laughs> that's the I, plan. I think that's that's uh, really interesting. Now, this being Cameron's pet project, he's operating it from a lifestyle block at home. But even with just a couple of hectares and about 40 sheep, he has the typical Kiwi love of moving electric fence every day in the interest of rotational grazing. In fact, given he's grazing such a tight area, you could argue it's just as or even more important at this scale than on bigger blocks. Look carefully and you'll notice he uses four strands of wire rather than the customary three. I wonder if these wild little sheep might be hard on the fences. Look at this. So we'll just stop here for a second because these sheep, we're getting a, we've really come on a, on a really blue ribbon day. Rescued, not been captured from the wild, <laughs> they've been rescued from the wild. They're on this incredibly lush green grass. They're not going to get any today, but they also get some, on some days, they get some cereal, don't they? So. Yeah, yep, they get barley or oats at the moment. So, barley. And they're getting a fresh, a fresh, Crystalix. So here we go, we'll open that up. We'll, we'll... Oh, oh, look at that. Oh, 16 ME. That's right. That is like, that is sheep sweeties. Yep. Um, are you sure 
you haven't been a blackie breeder in the past. <laughs> I'm going to wind some people up here. No, no, <laughs> I haven't had black. Well, actually, I saw some. I read some story about blackies in New Zealand. There was something about it. I think it's basically a bit of a myth. This, they reckon they bought some over and they're going to put them in the high country to lead the merinos <laughs> to safety when the bad weather hits. Because <laughs> obviously they, they thought blackies were smarter than merinos. But then. It said basically they reckon that the uh, marinos led the, <laughs> led, the, led the blackies into uh, trouble. <laughs> so there goes any chance of me ever being sponsored by the Scottish Blackface Breeder Society. I do like them really. If you've taken an interest to these quirky little sheep and want to keep up with the flock, Cameron posts great photos regularly to a Facebook page called Herbert Sheep of New Zealand. The link to that is in the video description, so be sure to chuck them a follow. Apart from that, thanks again for watching this far and supporting the channel. If you haven't already subscribed, you are missing a trick. Hit that button and the little bell next to it so you don't miss any future videos. Over and out viewers, see you for the next one.